my foods this year. So, what do you do, buy a generator? Oh, oh, is that us? Back, we're live. I'm Jay, Jay Fidel here on ThinkTech. Welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy on ThinkTech. So our show today is called, we call it, um, <clears throat> An Afternoon with Representative Chris Lee. We're going to talk to Chris about uh, energy and transportation. We're going to address the issue of whether there's uh, miles to go for us to get a hand on energy and transportation in Hawaii. Now, if you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 415-871-2474. And we also have my co-host, Mina Morita. So <clears throat> let me get this straight now. Chris is the chair of the House uh, Energy and Environmental Protection Committee right now today. However, yes. Mina Marita is his predecessor, and for many years she was the chair of that very same committee, and thence she was the chair of the PUC. This is a totally VIP show. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one person in between us, Denny Hoff uh, yeah, Kaufman. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, you yeah, mentioned, yeah. Yeah, for a short while. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> first we should talk about the session, Chris. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we need to hear it from you. We've heard it from many people. Many people have talked about this session as a special, special session. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in terms of a session that meets in the summer. I mean, the session that met in the spring was special. You know, it was a very different year than I think most people have ever seen before. Number one, in D.C., you got you know Trump administration, which mm -hmm. is uh, playing, placing a lot of pressure on, on federal funding and all kinds of stuff. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, but locally, we had a lot of big issues uh, rail returned, um, among other things, that that kind of blew up at the end of the session, and and that sort of cast, I think. So uh, I want to kind of take this kind of logically. <laughs> sure. So first of all, what was the highlight for you personally in this session? You know, there's actually a lot. I mean, I think despite all those headlines that we're just talking about, mm -hmm. that did happen. One thing. Um, that really stood out was something that went completely under the radar. Didn't get a single piece of coverage anywhere. Mm -hmm. It was a, a piece of. It was a resolution that the state passed. We passed it unanimously, Republicans, Democrats, House, and Senate. And what it did was it made Hawaii the first state in the country to say that it should be a right of all families to be financially, economically secure. Mm -hmm. And then sets up a process to help get us there and evaluate things like a universal basic income mm. and other mechanisms that are being talked wow, about. Wouldn't that be great, huh? But haven't yet been done here in Hawaii. Yeah, that would right. be great. We've got local support, too. Uh, Piero Midyar uh, just put in a whole ton of money into a pilot project in Kenya, I think almost half a billion dollars, mm -hmm. to give out to people to test what this would mean for an economy and what we would do here in our own economy, which is um, very exposed to automation and loss of jobs because of uh, you know, autonomous vehicles and all the kinds of things that are coming down the pipe. So that's something which is, I think, so, a real So way. the next step for that resolution is to, is, is this a study or how is it's, it structured? It's a working group. So mm -hmm. um, it's going to be the Department of Labor and the Department of uh, Business, Economic Development, Tourism, mm -hmm. uh, Chamber of Commerce, Labor Unions, everybody coming together to figure out um, how much are we currently spending as a state on social mm -hmm. services, what is our exposure in our economy to um, automation and job loss and all these sorts of things coming up, and what will that mean financially for the state? Mm -hmm. And starting with that baseline, we can then evaluate meaningfully what will it cost to actually make sure that we have a future here for our families mm -hmm. and an economy that's sustainable. Wow, that's pretty. That's, that's pretty visionary, yeah. actually. Yeah, so and is definitely. Is there a deadline on that, on that uh, <laughs> committee? Are they supposed to report back to somebody by a certain day? Yeah, we'll be getting a report back um, beginning of uh, next year, right as the legislature reconvenes. Great. That's great. We want to we want to follow that. Mm -hmm. See yeah. what happens. Yeah. So interesting. It didn't get that much publicity. Yeah. So are there any um, uh, bills sitting in the? on the governor's desk that was a highlight for the legislature as a whole? I think the legislature as a whole, there is one that stands out. And um, it does go back to you know, cost of living and all the big stuff we're seeing mm -hmm. here. And it's a bill that um, finally starts to 
give money back to local residents. Earn income tax credit. Earn income Finally. tax credit. Which, Finally. Which has been a champion for long before any of us were around. So, Are you saying I'm old? <laughs> I'm saying you've led the way. Uh, but yeah, so after, after you know, decades mm -hmm. of Hawaii not being um, not mm -hmm. providing something like this that most other yeah. states do. We're finally being able to give support to working yeah. families yeah. in a meaningful way. Yeah, that's big. That's great. Yeah. How about in the uh, energy environmental realm? Any highlights? Um, yeah, off the top of my head, um, not only are we kicking more money over to our schools for energy efficiency and other mm -hmm. things, but um, there is a bill that would um, set up a process for farmers, local mm -hmm. farmers in the ag sector to be able mm -hmm. to be compensated mm -hmm. um, and qualify for carbon credits to sequester oh. carbon. Mm -hmm. And that's something which could be a, a sorely needed revenue stream mm -hmm. for a lot of folks, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. particularly when it's done in conjunction <laughs> with PV and other renewables that they can use um, to help offset their own emissions. Mm -hmm. Is that likely mm -hmm. to be signed? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got favorable, I mean, I think almost all the testimony, I think all the testimony actually was in support. And right now, mm -hmm. Hawaiian Airlines, among other um, local companies, are looking at putting in millions of dollars in carbon offsets. And we want to be able to keep that money here in our own economy and reinvest it. So this would be a vehicle to do that. That's good for agriculture. That's, That's the important thing. Yeah, they need various income streams, and yeah. definitely this helps. You were going uh -huh. to ask Chris about the, the, the bill that uh, provided a target for clean energy and transportation. I know you are. Right. You know, we're all watchers here. And so one of the bills that we were watching was House Bill 1580. Um, and I guess the, the main portion of that bill was setting renewable fuels targets. And, um, you know, we saw what happened to it at, at the uh, final hours of conference committees. And so, you know, understanding that it's a really big task to come together to put guiding principles, policies forward, have you any suggestions on how to tackle um, kind of gnarly big policy issues like um, setting these kinds of targets, but more so um, because we're anticipating so many uh, disruptions in the transportation sector mm -hmm. um, with things like autonomous cars, so advancing technologies. Do you have any suggestions on how to move forward on these big picture kinds of issues and, and the policies sure. needed? Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, you know, 1580 was a bill that uh, I think it was one of the first years we've had a real significant discussion at the legislature about uh, transportation. electrifying transportation yeah. and what that means, you know, decades from now. Mm -hmm. But um, the bill, when it died, didn't die on its merits. Mm -hmm. I think there was large consensus in the House and Senate that this was the general direction that we wanted to go. And our law right now, our state mm -hmm. plan, currently says that we want to eliminate fossil fuels for ground transportation here in the state. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a date attached to it, but that's just a guiding principle. And so this would have taken that next step. I think one of the things that we did see out of um, that prior law passed a couple of years ago is the Department of Transportation getting together with the Energy Office, creating this working group with a whole bunch of different stakeholders to look at what are those realistic, actual, actionable mm -hmm. steps? Mm -hmm. And what's the low-hanging fruit to get started on as mm -hmm. we make this transition? I think that's something that especially now has been um, invaluable. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to move forward now to this next step and figure out all right, what's realistic and how are we going to get there, um, I think for sure we've got to uh, try and analyze as best we can what resources we have locally to be able to leverage. And right now, um, I just got back from California actually meeting with their Senate president um, who's been doing um, a lot of work in this area, mm -hmm. as well as the Energy Commission and the PUC, their CPUC. Um, and they're all working in the same uh, general space as we are here. And of course, mm -hmm. they've got a lot more resources yeah. to bring to bear. And they have a market. That's they right. They can drive the market. Yeah. That's right. And they are driving the market mm -hmm. as we speak. And uh, one of the guys was just saying, you know, right now their, their current um, goal is uh, to sell 100% zero emissions vehicles by 2050. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at advancing that. Uh, potentially as much as 10 years mm -hmm. um, based on what the market's actually done in some of these places mm -hmm. in California right now. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting um, hundreds of millions of dollars in various channels to try and tackle this problem of how you actually get from here to there. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, there's a couple things I think people don't realize that are already happening that will probably have much more an influence in where we go than any policy we could put into law. You know, when I was um, graduating from high school, which was only a few years ago, like 1999. <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, but at that point, you know, driving in Hawaii was um, it was a must do, and it was a, a real desire for everybody. I remember in our high school, everybody wanted their driver's license. Mm -hmm. At that time, in 1999, 99% um, of 25 to 29 year olds had driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. Today, that number has plummeted to just 65%, and it's dropping every single wow. year. Wow. And that's, um, wow, that's something so that's reflected across almost every age demographic mm -hmm. um, and community around the is state. Is there a reason? What is the reason? People want to get around in other ways than, than owning and driving a car. Or the other thing that we've come to realize, I think, um, which Mina had a lot of um, influence in is our, our zoning and planning policy. So now we're not building suburbs that are way out in the middle of nowhere. So now people can live and work in the same place. And it's cheaper and it saves time. So it makes a lot more sense. So we're on this pathway already that's mm -hmm. changing the way that we commute. Mm -hmm. um, but you layer on top of that now the uh, EVs that are on the road mm -hmm. and the, the pricing differences that creates for consumers who can now have multiple options for how to get around as well as um, you know, rail and other public transportation options coming online. And the biggest thing, of course, is once autonomous vehicles truly arrive, and I mean, there are autonomous cars driving around on mm -hmm. streets in cities around the country right now, but within the next five to 10 years, as all the latest you know, Booz Allen and Price Waterhouse Coopers and all these big um, firms are looking at, as well as the auto manufacturers, there may come a point where it's cheaper not to even own a car, but to subscribe to a service, like an Uber service, sure. where you can just call up a car that's yeah. driving out there on the road, and it'll take you around. It's inherent in it, don't you think? Because everything yeah. is automated. You know, the whole thing is one big computer. And so you try out your cell phone, push a button, and the thing arrives two minutes later. Right. Gee, that's better than owning one. It's a combination of Uber and next chapter yeah. Uber. <laughs> if you think about it, I mean, everybody owns who owns cars today they probably spend 95% of their time sitting idle, doing nothing, in your garage or at your garage That's at work. True. Mm -hmm. And so now, if you have an opportunity with an autonomous car to be dropped off by your car and then rent it out on an online platform where someone else can get a trip from the airport to home throughout the day, um, it becomes much more efficient. So the number of vehicles on the road that you would need to service a population of our size so, dramatically drops. So I guess the larger question is that you know, this is sort of similar to um, electricity policy. You know, there's this whole big transformation on how we uh, live, work, and do business. Right. And, and so the next uh, area is transportation and all the disruption that's happening in transportation. So how do we set the platforms necessary right. to move forward? So how do we, is there a way to break this down into manageable bite-sized pieces where um, we can develop the policy and uh, build a consensus to move in a certain direction. And then this, sorry, this, then the second question is, do you think the reorganization of the house um, lends itself to take on these kind of well, one, one big, at a time. big issues. <laughs> I know, I, I, you know, Chris is really good at this. He can frame his thoughts, and then I won't have to interrupt him with well, questions. I want to add something to that mix. All right, well, and that is, well, pile on. what about the resolution, or rather the, the target bill that, that failed in this session? Is that useful? I mean, uh, uh, shall we assume that it will pass next year? Uh, and is there something else we should do in addition to that to move this ahead? Sure. So um, uh, you guys need a little scoreboard that like pops up right over here in the, in, in the feed, right? So you, you can click these things off. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to both the long-term planning and this like, kind of uh, broad goal mm -hmm. and then fitting in these individual pieces of what makes sense next and how do you proceed, I think there's definitely um, uh, an ideal way to do it. And um, what has already been looked at in this working group between the Department of Transportation and the Energy Office um, there's about 37 or 38 uh, uh, individual sort of actionable items. Everything from looking at uh, reducing um, transit times and, and distances uh, in zoning all the way down to how do you get more people to take the bus or mm -hmm. uh, get on a bike or walk. 
um, and then provide incentives, for example, for people to switch over to an electric vehicle over the long term. Uh, these things clearly are in a priority list. Some things are way hard and really expensive. Others are really easy and kind of a no-brainer and cheap. So we can definitely start with a few of those pieces and mm -hmm. already get the ball rolling. Um, when it comes to uh, that broader goal um, and setting that, uh, I think there is value in doing so for sure. Now, one of the things that is happening right now, especially in light of the administrative change in DC, is that you have um, streams of funding that are now shifting. Mm -hmm. Federal funding that may no longer be coming in for energy projects, for example, um, which we just found out about in the, the administration's budget this week, mm -hmm. um, as well as now alternative means of financing coming from uh, large corporations like Google and others who are investing in this mm -hmm. play space. But we are competing um, against other states, California, of course, but more specifically against other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing when it comes to EVs um, and their infrastructure, the, all the charging infrastructure that's needed, nobody really knows exactly what a built-out environment looks like, what saturation looks like, where you have workplace chargers and chargers in condos and all around. So we are competing against other folks for a lot of these resources to put this stuff in. And people are, I don't want to say they're giving away money, but they're looking for opportunities to mm -hmm. invest. Hawaii is perfect. Oahu in particular, where it's dense, it's small, we have the kind of environment that, that this stuff really fits into. Mm -hmm. So if we can demonstrate that we have the political will to not only set a long-term goal, but to make sure that we're going to take steps to get there and commit to that, I think there's a lot of support that could come to bear. And we've been talking with um, specific vendors and companies in the Bay Area, in LA, um, in Nevada and other places, Tesla and others, who are looking to partner and make these investments in Hawaii. And that's one of the reasons why I think 1580, um, setting that goal and doubling down on our commitment to say, yes, we want to get there. We don't know exactly how, but we're going to do everything we can. And for all the folks in the private sector looking to invest, um, both locally and elsewhere, you know, we will politically um, help you and get out of your way when we need to. I think that's the value in the bill itself. And the last thing I'll say on that is, um, you know, when we passed 100% RPS, and I think even the RPS, um, and Mina's credited for creating our RPS yeah, here but, in the state. But I, I wanted a, a, a floor. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> a but also, the thing that changed, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and even the utility lobbied against it up until mm -hmm. the, the minute it passed, um, as well as some of the, the fossil fuel stakeholders. But the minute it did, I mean, everybody got on board and said, you know what, we have this goal, we're all committed. And the amount of progress that we've seen um, since then, and the amount of investment that's being made, and the kinds of things that are happening, it was night and day between prior and, and after the passage of that. I think in the same way, what we're hoping to do in a much larger uh, national conversation is say, look, Hawaii is here alongside California and others who are already going this route. And we're committing to this future. We are a place to invest. We are open for business. And the best part about this is the faster we can roll out electric charging infrastructure, the faster, ultimately, we'll be able to empower people to hopefully save on their commutes, uh, to save on costs for transportation, and ultimately stabilize our energy grid and help balance everything going on, because this is a whole new world of opportunity for everybody. And it's a whole new world for a break. It's a perfect time for a break. We take a break down one minute break. That's uh, Chris Lee and Mina Morita. We'll be right back for more on the same subject. So, what we need to well, I, you in, in, inherent in your answer was something about seeing into the future and figuring out what it's going to look like later, and then working to that. Do we know what it's going to look like? I mean, there's variables. There's I things mean, are going to change. But different people have different ideas, but no one, I think, has the, the yeah, full I, answer. For example, I, I, you could build a, a thousand charging stations, but if the Uber automated car comes true, yeah. you don't need them. Maybe. I mean, I think there's, there's, there's several issues here. One is, you know, uh, the consumer's preference in what they're mm -hmm. buying. You know, and, and so, you know, we all know people buy trucks here, a lot of trucks here. So meeting that consumer preference and, and then, um, but with the acknowledgement that, you know, you have Good. people that just don't want to own cars. three. Okay. okay, we're back with Chris Lee and Mina Morita. We're talking about transportation energy in Hawaii. 
And um, you know, we're talking about like making it clear that we have the political will to attract investment, to attract laboratory situations from companies that can come here and use Hawaii as a transportation energy uh, platform and laboratory. Um, but you know, talking in the break, um, you know about what what it should look like, what it will look like. It's hard to know what it'll look like because all the parts are moving, um, including this uh, automated car thing, which could change things dramatically. How do you how do you find out? How do you deal with that? How do you determine you know what kind of incentives you want to build? You're talking. You know, Mina was talking during the break about the public and the market. The market should. Be, I know you're a market person. She's a market person. <laughs> I don't look like it, but yeah. She, she wants the market to you know to determine what we do. We need. Yeah. But you know, sometimes you need a benevolent dictator person to choose the expression. <laughs> a benevolent dictator legislature, if you will, who says, you know, we see it, we understand it, and we are going. Th we're going there. And we're not only going to, we're not going to just accept what people want in the marketplace. We're going to incentivize them. We're going to shape the market. We're going to tune, because we know that there, if you have too many cars, it's no good. If you use too much fossil fuel, it's no good, and so forth. We're going to try to save the state by incentivizing people to do the right thing, whatever they really want. <laughs> so Mino's making a good point about, um, you want to, you Mention that real quick. Uh, well, the, trucks and yeah. So it appears that the preference in Hawaii is small trucks or sometimes b really big trucks, and and so you know it, it's it's not like the electricity market where you have the utility that's being regulated and that's responsible for meeting the re renewable portfolio um, standards uh, goals mandates. So in the transportation sector, when you're looking at this whole change out of vehicles. Um, first of all, you still have a lot of old cars on the road. Then you have the consumer making these purchases. So with that kind of um, dependency on the market, how do these changes take place? Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the things that we looked at in this was, you know, do you do something prescriptive or do you mm -hmm. uh, figure out how you can really push the market along? And I think nowhere in the, um, the discussion that we had this year was anybody trying to force anybody to give up their, their favorite truck or, yeah. or whatnot. I drive a gas guzzler too, and, you know, <laughs> full disclosure. <laughs> but, um, but the idea is how do you put the infrastructure in place to allow that consumer choice? Mm -hmm. Because right now, for example, I would drive an EV except I have nowhere to plug a car in. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible, a street park. Yeah. And so I think like a lot of people who live in condos and, and everything else, they're looking for the same thing. And so how do we create this critical mass of EV infrastructure um, out there? And I think that's really the goal of aligning everybody toward this long-term um, long target. And I think one of the things that we hope out of this, um, you know, we don't know uh, what the next Toyota um, light truck is going to look like, but we do know that the company is committed by 2040 to sell mm -hmm. only electric vehicles. And we're seeing already both with Tesla's mm -hmm. new um, heavy duty trucks and uh, as well as some of the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles out there, eventually these, these um, vehicles in all variations, at big SUVs and whatnot, will all be there. So we need to make sure that we're ready so that when mm -hmm. people want to buy them, they can. So the other critical issue here is taxation policies because, you know, as you move towards electric vehicles um, and we're so highly reliant on, on gasoline taxes, you know, for, for the maintenance of our roads and, and uh, matching federal dollars, yeah. uh, you know, how do we go about this? And, and again, I go back to the question is, you know, with, with the house reorganization, you know, are we being set up correctly uh, in committee structure um, to, to move these real, again, gnarly, I don't know yeah. of any way to describe it, issues forward? Because I think, you know, on the electricity sector, that's where we see some of the sl slowness playing out in getting um, rate design correct, mm -hmm. you know, to, to move forward, make it equitable. And I, I see this big um, hurdle on the transportation side because we're so reliant on gasoline taxes. Yeah, you know, um, the House reorgan reorganized uh, at the end of the last day of session. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a new Speaker of the House, Scott Psyche, 
Um, everything else is a little bit in flux at the moment, but we'll have a committee lineup, I think, over the summer sometime. Mm -hmm. But that being said, the biggest difference between the House and Senate, the Senate has one committee that handles both energy and transportation. Um, and those two really, I mean, go uh, hand in hand, and, and, and you cannot address one without the other, I think, at this point, mm -hmm. it's fair to say. In the House, we have two committees, one that addresses transportation, one that addresses energy. So when we need to get together, the current chair of the um, Transportation Committee is Henry Aquino, um, who's been working on that for a couple of years, uh, maybe four years, or maybe even longer. Mm -hmm. um, but we've worked well together, and I think the conversations we're going to have to have will have to address these things of equity and how do you, in a world of uh, proliferating EVs um, and no gas taxes paid by those drivers, pay for public infrastructure like roads and highways. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of bills that um, were proposed this year, some that moved along, which would tax vehicles by weight, for example. Um, we have another proposal that would do um, just a blanket uh, lump sum to the Department of Transportation to pay for roads every year and not even get into the metrics of who is paying from what type of vehicle or all that. Um, and in the long term, um, the other unknown X factor, of course, in all this is how much of that infrastructure will we still need? If you have fewer vehicles on the road in a much more efficient place, do you still need seven lanes wide right. highways? Mm -hmm. So all this stuff is hanging out there. Um, so, so in your recent travels, have you seen any technology that can help address the taxation issues? You know, um, Oregon actually, there's a number of states obviously looking mm -hmm. at this because it's a problem um, everywhere. But Oregon just implemented a vehicle miles traveled uh, pilot program. Mm -hmm. So the farther you drive, the more you help pay for the roads. Um, EVs, uh, because they're, they're electric and you mm -hmm. can communicate much more easily now in some places, uh, are being designed um, a, with pilot projects in mind that um, basically do the same thing based on your usage. And in some cases, Uber and other companies that are these ride-sharing companies that are the networks of vehicles out there um, have been tasked to contribute in their own way so that every ride they give, a portion of that goes to pay for whatever mm -hmm. fund. So some of these things are out there. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody's nailed it yet, but mm -hmm. I think the one thing that's for sure is that we'll have to come to an answer soon because ultimately we need our roads mm -hmm. and people are going to continue to buy EVs. We've mm -hmm. got 30% more sold this past year than the year before, and that's yeah, expected well, you, to When you give those continue. kinds of uh, uh, rebates very, and stuff, of course. We have very few electric vehicles on the highways. Overall, yeah. Overall, and, and um, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit of the people who are excited about the new technology, mm -hmm. they already bought. So now it's harder to sell this idea, and, and I think it's not moving as fast as I would like to see. So query, you know, you can incentivize or you can de-incentivize. You could say, as they have in other places, maybe outside the country, you want to buy a gas car, we're going to tax you really heavily, and we're going to try to discourage you from buying the gas car. That works, for sure. And the person with the big truck, you know, who doesn't need the big truck, the, the gas gobbler big truck, he's going to be discouraged if you add a big tax on that. And of course, it's the other kind of incentive, you know, where you offer a tax credit, which we used to do, but we're not doing anymore for electric vehicles. So is there anything on the, on the drawing board for either of those possibilities to actually shape this market that Mina would like to leave as free and unhampered? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think there's been a discussion, at least a serious discussion that I'm aware of on um, you know, additional taxes for people just because they drive a fossil fuel car. But um, the incentive question has come up a number of times. And of course, uh, we don't have uh, state money going into an incentive program right now, but there is federal money that's been available for some time, which is slowly going away. Um, but the other thing that we're starting to see is by 2026, the inflection point for the cost of an EV versus a traditional gas vehicle um, is going to flip. That's the year, supposedly. Um, in which it becomes cheaper to drive an EV and buy an EV up front than it is to buy a gas vehicle. And that's um, been shifting closer and closer, not only because we're getting closer to that year, but because the technology is evolving faster than anybody has ever imagined. And the cost of batteries and um, the equipment is coming down. So it may be a question in the next two or three years as to what point assuming that this is going to happen and EVs are going to be cheaper across the board, both upfront and in operational costs, at what point do we even need incentives uh, well, maybe not. to begin with? Maybe you're so, right. So uh, <laughs> in your recent travels, again, have you seen any, um, I, again, more increased um, efficiencies in cars, getting higher gas mileage in vehicles? I mean, with 
has it stopped or is the trend still no, um, I think um, increased mileage? The trend is still increased mileage mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And, and of course, you know, electric vehicles are, mm -hmm. are topping that list. But even amongst um, gas cars mm -hmm. and light duty vehicles, you see um, continual gains. Now, mm -hmm. with the Trump administration looking at undoing some of those standards yeah. that, that produce that, we don't really know what's going to happen. But I think it's safe to say that with manufacturers ranging from BMW and Toyota, um, Hyundai, um, of course Tesla and Nissan and everybody else already moving in the direction of full electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles, um, uh, I think it's only a matter of time. And we may just be um, having this discussion, which may be moot in a couple of years yeah. anyway. But let me offer this thought. I mean, we could have 100% electric cars about a certain point. But if they're all being driven by oil, you know, uh, in the generation system of the electricity that charges the batteries in the cars, we haven't really achieved anything. This is what's so exciting, though, because I think this is where there's most potential. When you merge transportation, and let's assume we get to 100% EVs on this island, if we were to do that overnight, now you've got all these batteries driving around that can capture mm -hmm. that load when it's, let's say, when power is cheapest at night and we're now charging our vehicles at night you, you stabilize uh, the the demand curve throughout the day and now it's cheaper for everybody to produce electricity theoretically um, if you can be more flexible in that power consumption and usage mm -hmm. so there's a lot of possibility here how do you do that what do you what kind of legislation do you pass in order to make that happen well I think uh, the PUC yeah it's all I think it's all dependent on rate design yeah mm -hmm. you know and and so basically it's like when you have your vehicle attached the utility would have the ability to draw power when it needs or to dump power when this there's is excess. This is a better place. You remember a better place? This is <laughs> yeah. exactly the model yeah. that yeah. they were thinking of I mean, five, yeah. six years ago. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're out of time, Mina. Mm -hmm. So this is your opportunity to summarize what we learned from Chris Lee today and um, you know, sort of tell the people what they can expect going forward. Well, well we, I think, first of all, thank you, Chris, for coming today. Or oh, thanks for having me. Chris, I'm sorry, Representative Lee, for coming today. <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate you having here. And um, it sounds like you've got a lot of work cut out for you we all do. in preparing for the next session yeah. and and so um, looking forward to that thanks for having me and thank you Chris it's been great to have you we'll yes. do it again we'll do it again all right thanks <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah thanks that was good yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they are connected aren't they well, that makes the whole thing very sexy. Yeah. If they're connected. Yeah. You know, you've got to do both at the same time somehow. Well, you know, the, the part, of, part of it is, uh, again, this is where I feel Rico has a lot of shortcomings. It's all the analytics, you know, so the ability to process data quickly and make timely decisions. Yeah. And, and, so more important. Yeah, I mean, 